Okay, I would like to introduce to you our spe next speaker, so Kasper Ullmann, which is a senior legal and policy analyst at FINMA. Kasper, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hey. Let me just jump right into it. Um, firstly, who or what is FINMA and um, who am I? Uh, FIMA is, uh, um, is the Integrated Financial Market Supervisory Authority of Switzerland. What we do is we license and we authorize banks, securities dealers, insurances, asset managers, collective investment schemes and uh, FMIs, so it's quite a, a bit. Um, once they're uh, authorized, we supervise them and if anything goes wrong, which we don't hope of course, the enforcement team steps in. Um, and enforcement also takes place, of course, uh, with regard to, to unregulated activities, so uh, businesses that uh, operate without a license. FIMA has also the competence to regulate in a limited uh, space, and, and this is where I work, I'm in the regulatory uh, department of FIMA. And with regard to ICOs and blockchain and fintech in, in general, I think this already shows a little bit um, uh, what we can do. Um, as an integrated authority, we have a holistic view on the market and on the regulatory landscape. Now, when we navigate that landscape, um, what, are, what are our principles, our mandates, uh, what is our compass in, in uh, assessing ICOs and assessing blockchain and fintech in general? Uh, the mandate of FIMA is firstly to protect individuals and to protect the market as a whole. FIMA does not have the uh, mandate to do promotion. Uh, we've heard about the sandbox, which is actually a carve out from the, the uh, banking license, but it's not a sandbox that we know from other parts of the world, so we don't do kind of uh, a coaching or a promotion of, of FinTech. We do contribute to the competitiveness and the, the strength of the financial center, but we only do that by um, sticking to our core a mission which is uh, protecting individuals and the market. Now, is that a disadvantage with regard to, to fintech and um, innovation? I don't think so. I think these principles can be uh, broken down to, to uh, other principles that uh, we've used and uh, still use to, to, uh, to do the best to, to uh, have an, uh, a vibrant and a functioning uh, fintechs uh, uh, scene. So firstly, we've heard about this from, from Nadine, uh, the regulation in Switzerland and also the regulation at FINMA um, in a, is technology neutral, so we don't want to regulate technology. We want to regulate markets and we want to regulate outcomes. The outcomes that the technology, or even if no technology is used, um, the outcome that, that results from, from the possible uses of, of technology. One main point, and I'm going to talk about this later, is legal certainty, so giving uh, clarity to the market what applies, what doesn't apply, and how they can navigate within the, the framework. And this framework is ideally principle-based. That means we don't uh, have a, a, a two specific rules, but rather flexible approach, which allows us to adapt also to, to, uh, to challenges and to, to changes in the market. And we've heard that Switzerland is, is slow. That might be true in some respects with regard to making new laws. But when it comes to applying laws that are actually principle-based, you know, we, you can react uh, pretty quickly. And I think that's the advantage of a principle-based regulatory system. Um, let's not forget, of course, zero tolerance for uh, criminal and illicit behavior in general. I think that's important. We want to uh, keep this market clean. And all of these points together, I think, lead to an uh, innovation-friendly uh, climate. At least that's uh, what we hope. Although we don't have, as I said, the, the, the main uh, goal to, to promote any kind of, of technology, any kind of, of specific business, but we want a, a clean and functioning financial market in Switzerland. Now, with regard to, to fintech, there are different approaches, of course, uh, in, in, uh, in, in handling that. 
and each and every country has a variation of one of these, uh, these uh, principles. Now, firstly, and I think that was in the early days, maybe, of, of, of uh, Bitcoin, it's on the anarchistic model, which allows just everything. And that's a, a possibility. Um, the, 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 uh, the opposite, of course, is a, is a pro prohibitionist approach, where you forbid everything as a reaction to, to new developments. And, of course, there's the middle ground, which we like to see ourselves in, and which we call the enlightened approach, where we try to, to understand what's going on, where you want to try to maximize the benefits, but also be mindful and uh, have an understanding of the risks and mitigate them as, as best as possible. And these risks, of course, they are known. It's money laundering, fraud, and the like. Um, the list goes on. Now, um, contributing to legal certainty and to, to uh, live after this, this um, uh, enlightened approach, um, when the IC boom really began, we were flooded with uh, requests. People wanted us to, to issue non-action letters. They wanted to know from us what does apply, what doesn't apply. Do I have to register? Do I need a license? And we pretty quickly saw that we couldn't uh, go on on a case-by-case -case basis. Firstly, uh, there was no legal certainty um, when you go on a case-by-case -case basis because the, you know the, the one that you handled, the first case, they know what, what, what's uh, the rule, but all the others don't. And you also have the, the challenge of treating everybody equally, so everybody should know upfront what the rules are, and I think that's especially important in a market which is so evolving so quickly, so you shouldn't give a head start to uh, a select group of people who know which rules apply and which can then tailor their business model to that kind of, of, of approach. So we issued our, our guidance on how we treat ICOs and the token models in February of this year. And I think as you might know by now, this is what we came up uh, with. We didn't reinvent the wheel. It wasn't the, the, uh, the, the primary objective, objective to, to, to do that. But the, the objective was to, to uh, bring a structure into the market and to apply the framework, the um, regulatory framework that we have to, to this um, landscape. And um, I think it has been well received. And uh, we're also a little bit proud that we see many uh, agencies and even international bodies uh, by now, which have adopted this uh, approach. So what have you done? There's a, an economic uh, way of looking at it, and there's a legal one. Uh, I, I don't want to go too much, too deep into both of these, especially the legal one. I could go on for, for years. But um, economically, we, we apply the dog test. I think that's the, 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 the technical term for what we do. Uh, we uh, look at the underlying economic purpose, which can be a, a means of payment, B, uh, the, the access to a kind of a, a service, or C, the securities aspect, which is, of course, a collective uh, term for, for many, many uh, possible tokens. Um, legally, I think the bisection runs here, I'm free on the other side, <laughs> uh, here between the payment and the, the other uh, two tokens, because um, the payment tokens here are tokens which are not attached to any legal claim. So the, the prime example uh, being Bitcoin, which of course doesn't represent the claim vis-a-vis -vis anybody else. Whereas utility and asset tokens are actually tokens, um, as we qualify them, which have claims attached to them vis-a-vis -vis an issuer. And what differentiates a utility from an asset token is uh, that this claim is on, on an asset side is uh, comparable actually to, to uh, claims that are traded on financial markets. Uh, we're talking about shares, debentures, um, derivatives, and uh, hybrids of those. Whereas the utility token is uh, more comparable to a voucher, for example, where you can buy a service which already exists, which you can spend then. So that's really the, the, uh, the differentiation. What does it mean? Now, the issuance, issuance of uh, means of payments, of, of payment tokens, is uh, subject to anti-money laundering regulations. So you need to, to register with an SRO. You need to uh, do your, do your uh, KYC and apply the, the, the AML rules. Uh, utility tokens may also fall under the AML um, because, and this uh, is important, two concepts here. 
Firstly, the concept of the hybrid token. So a token may fall under several of these uh, categories. An example being, for example, a, a, a token which is uh, at these stable coins, which is backed by, by a claim for, a, for an actual asset. So it has this security aspect. And it can also, at the same time, have the currency aspect because it serves as a means of, of exchange. <coughs> and the same applies, of course, to a utility token, which can represent uh, a claim for a service, but at the same time can be, in some cases, not necessarily, but in some cases, as a means of payment. So you have to use to apply the, the requirements cumulatively. And I think we've heard it said already in the panel, there's the concept of, of, of a um, like an adaptive qualification of the, of the economic purpose. The underlying structure of the, of the business model changes, of course, the, the, uh, the uh, qualification of the token follows, follows that economic reality. That leads me already to the more practical side. Should you want to issue your token uh, in Switzerland? Um, the guidelines, they, they state minimal information that FEMA needs to, to uh, uh, assess uh, your token from a financial market perspective. FEMA only uh, looks at this aspect, of course. There are many other aspects like uh, civil liability questions, prospectus uh, questions, tax, I think. Um, many others, FEMA can only do one, one thing, but at least that. Um, and I think that's an important point. You don't have to... Uh, 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 come to FEMA. So the, the idea of the guideline was, act, was actually to provide a framework for issuers to decide for themselves if they feel uh, comfortable and if they really understand the concepts uh, and not uh, need to come to FEMA, but they are free to do so. Um, we, of course, only uh, take this assessment up front. We can also take an ex post assessment, but that will come uh, might come from our enforcement division and that's probably not a desired outcome. So if you want our assessment, you would have to, to address us uh, before you actually launch your ICO and there's a, a fee uh, for formal increase. Um, just to give you like a, a ballpark figure, I think in, in uh, 2018, since the launch of the guidelines, we've had more than 130 formal uh, such formal requests, so it's quite a bit. And uh, should we have a little bit longer to respond to your inquiry, we, we hope uh, for your understanding also. But I think we are getting up to speed um, in applying these guidelines. And this is the, the uh, email address where you can reach us if you have specific uh, questions regarding a, a business model that you would have liked us to, to assess. So thank you very much, and looking forward to maybe seeing you in Switzerland or seeing your token in Switzerland. Who knows? Thank you.